go. Oh, he's back. Well, that was interesting. My entire <laughs> computer just crashed and said it ran into a problem and had to restart. Oh, <laughs> oh my. How fun. Always at the right time, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess let's... I have to make... You're the host, right? Well, I've actually made you co-host, so you could actually run the meeting if uh, this happens again. Okay. So let's uh, see if I can get into this again. Do, 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 do. There. Are we real? We Can go. you see my slides? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, I'm going to go to broadcast. And so we will be live here in three ish, one ish, two ish, somewhere around here. Uh, and we'll just uh, see if we can stay alive. So if I disappear, uh, it's all you. <laughs> I'll be back eventually. <laughs> Good evening. All right, we'll, we'll muddle through. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Reg Hoyt, and welcome to our fifth One Health seminar of the, the fall semester. And also, happy One Health Week for those Del Val students. Uh, we are currently enjoying a week to of celebrations of One Health. It's been five years since DelVal started delving into uh, this particular philosophy of recognizing that uh, the whole globe is a single system and that animals and people and environment are all part of this single system. And uh, we've got to think about things from a more transdisciplinary approach. And so uh, we're doing that at DelVal through three basic components. Uh, education, we're including it within many of our courses across the curriculum, uh, trying to encourage cross-disciplinary research as well, and then through outreach. And that's what tonight is all about, is outreach. Our seminar series is intended to not only engage our students and faculty, but also to engage our community. Uh, DelVal has has been a part of the Bucks County community for, well, since the 1890s. And uh, uh, we're hoping that you'll spend time with us in the future and have a chance to enjoy all of the uh, seminars that we, we bring to you, including this one tonight. Uh, if you enjoy what you're seeing and you want to know more about One Health at DelVal, at the bottom, just delval.edu forward slash One Health. Uh, and you can not only uh, hear about what we've got upcoming, but also you can see past uh, seminars, including this one in a, in a period of time. Well, right now, I'd like to turn it over to Shannon from Heritage Conservancy, who uh, is graciously co-sponsoring our event this evening. Thank you, Reg. I'm Shannon Friedevoss Siller with Heritage Conservancy, and we're a local nonprofit based in Doylestown and we work to protect land and historic places. And we've been doing that mission since 1958. And we've helped to preserve over 15,000 acres of open space, farmland, wildlife habitat, and important watershed areas all throughout Bucks and Montgomery counties. So while much of what we do um, and what we protect at Heritage Conservancy, um, you know, most of those things that we're protecting have been around for a very long time, especially the historic buildings that we're protecting, like our headquarters in Aldi Mansion. Other areas of land, though, have faced a lot of change through time. Um, the land in our area has seen the shifts in the number of houses built on it, the roads established, and the wear and erosion on the stream banks. As different invasive plant species have been introduced to our area, and as the needs of the wildlife have changed, we at Heritage Conservancy have worked to respond to those changes by making improvements at our preserves, including planting over 300 native plants each year to improve riparian buffers and installing pollinator meadows like the one that you see here, where there was um, a hay field that now is a wonderful four acre meadow um, that's filled with a variety of pollinators. And the presentation that Peter's going to, um, to give here is going to showcase unique landscape, 
landscape design projects, including the greening of impervious surfaces. Heritage Conservancy has some recent experience with that, which is it's been a very exciting project and a long project that we've, we've gone through. We are excited about the progress that has been made at the old PennDOT site along uh, the Broad Street Corridor in Doylestown. Town. So you might have passed this public park sign when you've driven through the area. This um, was once a brown field, and so now this impervious surface is being turned into a green field consisting of a three acre public park for everyone in the community to enjoy. And Heritage Conservancy has been very proud to be a part of this community green space um, that's been made through, possible through a public-private partnership with the borough of Doylestown. So if you're in the area, stop by and see as this progress continues. Um, it'll soon be a wonderful park for people to, to get out and enjoy the, the lovely weather when we have it. If you want to learn more, feel free to visit our website at heritageconservancy.org. And you know, with that, we're just really excited to um, be here as a co-sponsor um, for Del Val and support um, Bowman's Hill in this um, great presentation. And we can't wait to hear more from Peter tonight. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Shannon. That was a lovely introduction. The Heritage Conservancy does amazing work, and I'm looking forward to growing our partnership for our two like-minded organizations between the Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve and Heritage Conservancy. And Reg, thank you for having me this evening. Um, Delaware Valley University is a great, amazing place, and I've hired uh, several of your alumni throughout my career, so I'm uh, doubly glad to, to be here and sharing my experiences with everyone tonight. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm working between two laptops here, so forgive me if things go a little slowly here, but I think we've got that going. Great. All right. Well, um, again, I'm Peter Couchman. I'm the Executive Director of Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, and um, I'll be presenting um, today some experiences is my own career, ecological responsibility from scratch, creating something from nothing. All right. Let's see if I can get here. There we go. So we all know anecdotally the benefits of engaging with green space with nature and with green space. Um, I think this is displayed beautifully by this photo of the moss garden at um, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve in Penn's Woods. Um, engaging with nature really refreshes, it revitalizes, it reinvigorates us. It supports our own personal well-being and our physical and our emotional health. And this is really evident since COVID, right? We've seen a record increase in visitation to state parks and to public green spaces, including Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, representing really our desire um, in quarantine situations to get out of the house and our need to find solace and a sense of peace. So how many of you have heard the term Shinrin-yoku, a Japanese term? Uh, you may have heard of the English translation, forest bathing. It's really an attempt to describe the intangible benefits of interacting with nature. But there are indeed very, very tangible benefits to forest bathing that are scientifically documented, including lowering your blood pressure, decreasing your cortisol levels, cortisol being the stress hormone in our bodies, decreasing your heart rate, decreasing the measures of depression, anxiety, fatigue, and confusion. And there's even scientific data out there that shows that it increases your body's immune response capability in cancer patients. So just imagine now having the opportunity to create this phenomenon from scratch, building this from where um, it did not exist before. And I've been fortunate enough to have this experience a few times in my own career. So tonight's lecture will focus on a couple of these opportunities, creating ecological responsibility and restorative environments from scratch. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of projects. The first is a green roof project. This was a new construction project in uh, Woodbury, New York, which is located in Long Island, right outside of New York City. And this is the new corporate headquarters of Arizona Ice-T. 
So let's start with kind of defining what a green roof is. And I hope a lot of you have been to a green roof or seen a green roof. Um, so what is a green roof? Basically, in its very most basic definition, it is an engineered rooftop environment of vegetative material. There are several benefits of a green roof. Um, whoops. Uh, green roofs have benefits both to the building structure and to the wider environment as a whole. It, first of all, it holds and retains uh, and cleans stormwater, which prevents fast runoff that can often overwhelm urban sewer systems, causing flooding and damage to potable water systems. It also mitigates the heat, urban heat island effect. And as if you're not sure what that is, just anecdotally, you notice that urban centers are much warmer than their surrounding suburbs. So looking at the temperature, um, base temperature in Philadelphia, for instance, downtown versus in New Hope, Pennsylvania. So um, uh, how urban centers are typically warmer than the surrounding areas. It re green roofs serve to eliminate reflective heat caused by traditional rooftops. They also have insulating effects for building structures. Um, interior heating and cooling costs are mitigated through that insulative property. It also improves and expands usable living and working space. In addition, it provides wildlife habitat for birds, insects, and pollinators. Plant material on a green roof also absorbs carbon dioxide. And lots of really great plants, including a lot of native plants, can thrive in these types of environments because on a rooftop, the environmental conditions are typically very um, at both ends of the spectrum. There's great temperature fluctuation, there's drought versus saturation conditions, etc. Imagine getting your roof um, replaced in the middle of August. Be nice to those roofing contractors because they're up there sweating um, like crazy. Yet in the middle of January in a snowstorm, it's pretty frigid up there. So you're getting both ends of the spectrum and environmental conditions on the top of a roof. So how did this particular project begin? It started with the plants. The roof design in this particular case was done by Dennis Schrader of Landcraft Environments in Mattituck, New York, again just down the road from uh, the construction site of Arizona Ice T's new corporate headquarters. We planted trays and trays of plant material in spring of 2009, awaiting the installation which was scheduled for later that summer and early fall. Now I need to preface this part of the um, lecture by saying I am not a green roof expert. Um, this is one particular project I was very fortunate to take place in, but um, this is not my particular industry. And so um, I just want to make that very clear. So as we in, uh, brought in all of this plant material, here we are carrying the first arrival of succulents from Emory Knoll Farms, a nursery which is just outside of Baltimore. I was really working out that year, lots of core strength and remember to always lift from your legs. Uh, and here's some of the plugs prior to planting, roots teased out and ready to plant. We started with about 12,000 plugs, putting those into production prior to planting. Here's the entire nursery crew working on planting the plugs directly into trays containing uh, green roof media, which, what I'll, uh, which is what it was planted in. And I'll explain more about that later. And the finished product was about a four and a half inch potted plant that we will be using for planting later. Here are the trays immediately after planting, waiting to grow on under glass in the greenhouse uh, in early spring. Now there are two types of green roof installation solutions. Something similar to what you're seeing here, this is a modular system, which are tray units which are pre-planted and placed directly on the rooftop. There's also direct planting where you can put growing media directly on the rooftop and then plant your plants directly in the growing media, much like you would do at ground level in a garden. We chose to do direct planting for this particular project because we weren't confident in the modular systems that this project we could afford at the time. Modular systems were rather expensive at, uh, at the time. Now keep in mind, this was about 10 years ago. Um, seemed like acres and acres of material, all watered by hand in preparation for, for the installation later that season. By midsummer, the plant material is full and lush and ready for installation here. Now we go to the roof. 
Here's the roof and spring prior to the inst installation. It's a very traditional roof, which is what you'd see on most corporate buildings, commercial buildings, highly reflective concrete base. And this particular project, um, we were planting half of the roof, which was 20,000 square feet, was approximately half an acre. So the roof is really 40,000 square feet in total, but we were only doing half of it in this, in this application, which is a very large green roof as it goes. So as in most commercial roofs, um, there are HVAC units to contend with, other utilities to have to deal with and consider. This particular picture was taken in, from inside of the clubhouse on the roof, uh, which I believe eventually became um, cafe for the, for the building. So the first step in really building a green roof is to apply a waterproof membrane directly to the roof's concrete surface. Um, it really seals the surface to prevent water seeping into the interior of the building. And we needed five consecutive dry days to be able to, uh, to do this, to lay down the waterproof uh, membrane. We didn't get that five consecutive days for over a month. So we were automatically, right from the beginning, um, delayed in this particular project. But I think some of these pictures do show kind of the size and the scope of the rooftop we're, we're dealing with. 20,000 square feet is, is a lot of area to cover. Step two, uh, the construction materials, here they are being delivered by crane from the future parking lot of the building. This particular roof was um, above the fifth floor of the building, so it really took a substantial effort to get materials all the way up to the roof. Now, above the waterproof membrane, which is on top of the, the concrete uh, base of the roof, is the first layer of construction material called the drainage mat. Here's a close-up of the drainage mat. It really functions to create adequate drainage, as well as a small, small reservoir of water to be available to the plant root zones. So the close-up, you can see it looks kind of like an egg carton. All of those little divots there are reservoirs for the water. And then there's a root barrier fabric on top of that, which prevents root infiltration, yet allows the water to move back and forth through osmosis. But it doesn't allow the roots to dig in and, uh, and uh, fill up those little reservoirs. Uh, installation for that really is by snapping the sheets together or by gluing them together. So you just kind of roll it out just like you would be rolling out a carpet. And speaking of carpet, um, that really kind of makes up the next layer of construction material called the moisture retention mat. So this really looks exactly like carpet padding in your house. The purpose of this moisture retention mat is to um, create yet another reservoir of water available to the root zones of plants, just like carpet padding. And it, as many of you maybe have spilled a big glass of water on your carpet and you got to peel it up and that Carpet pad is soaked and it takes forever for it to dry. Well, in this application, that's a good thing. So it really kind of uh, illustrates why we would use material like that in this construction. Here we are installing the drainage mat going over the roof um, and then the uh, moisture retention mat on top of that just rolls straight out like carpet. And here we are with the two layers together or nearing completion of rolling out that moisture retention mat. Here's again, illustrating the size and scope of this particular project. And in my experience, this is one of the largest green roofs I've, I've encountered. The next phase in this is design layout. Um, we did that in, with <laughs> measuring tape and uh, spray paint, um, marking out uh, pathways, uh, infrastructure, other construction elements. Here we are marking the uh, decking and framing corners in, uh, in spray paint directly on that moisture retention mat, marking dimensions, marking materials. Um, here's the designer, Dennis Schrader, who's probably getting some bad news about a delayed delivery or weight restrictions. I'll talk a little bit more about weight restrictions, which as you can imagine on a rooftop are key. Highest priority in designing and installing a green roof is consideration for weight restrictions, which also needs to include your snow load for that area. Next, after we kind of lay out the design, we're laying out here the edging for the future walkways. Um, you can kind of see here that extensive system of walkways to help um, folks engage with the space once it's done. Um, the edging was really made up of lightweight aluminum. It's very important, again, to keep the weight in check. So everything was, uh, all the supplies, all the materials uh, were um, sourced and specced um, with their weight in mind. We had about 1,400 linear feet of aluminum uh, edging in this particular project. You can see some of the walkways now are lined out. 
And uh, then we move on to deck framing. There are several decks in this particular project for and patios. We used basically standard pressure treated wood for the framing. And then we used a timber tech comp composite for the flooring. Uh, here's a close up of timber tech. It's 12% post consumer recycled plastic. So it's weatherproof, it's lightweight, and it's fire resistant, which is also extremely important on a rooftop application. Um, for a lot of the structure thresholds and patios and walkways, uh, we used um, uh, porous pavers. The next slide is a close-up of a porous paver, but it really functions just like a Rice Krispie treat, right? It is gravel or another aggregate that is bound together by a very clear uh, glue agent. Being porous, it allows that water infiltration to move through the layers of this construction so that water is either reserved for the plants or moved on out of that roof. Next, we installed the bluestone screenings for the walkways. Here they are being delivered via super sack, um, craned up to the rooftop, and they are heavy. So we needed to, once we got them to the roof, they couldn't stay in one place very long. You had to distribute it very, very quickly. And here I am carting those immensely heavy um, super sacks. Again, lots of strength required here. I wish I could say I did this all by myself, but I had a lot of help <laughs> to work me through that. But seriously, it really, weight is an issue. That heavy sack cannot stay in one place on the roof very long. You need to immediately move that out. This roof was designed to hold only about 25 pounds per square foot, which was a change from the original spec of 50 pounds per square foot. So in this particular instance, the design had to be reworked very quickly at the last minute to accommodate these new load restrictions. Um, we had to um, uh, change the growing media depth and the type of material that we had to use. Um, for instance, in our walkways, we were gonna use bluestone screenings for all the walkways. We had to change that out to um, heat expanded shale, which is a much more lightweight material. So had to be very responsive for those weight restrictions. Uh, we also use diamond rock, that's D-Y-M-O-N. This is a made out of uh, fiberglass material, very similar to the, the Kevlar and bulletproof vests. Very, very light material. And you basically, we would just glue them to cinder blocks and place them around to uh, serve as retaining walls um, for aesthetic value as well. And as I mentioned, this design really created a very truly unique and exciting living space. As you can see from this uh, concept drawing, it included a putting green. Uh, here we are putting the putting green uh, base, applying that to the rooftop here. Uh, the golf course company that did the installation, it was their first uh, rooftop application, I'm happy to say. And here we are with the finished uh, putting green ready for practice. Next comes the growing media. It was applied throughout the entire roof. As I mentioned, this was a direct planting project. It was directly on top of the moisture retention mat uh, for direct planting. It was brought to the roof via blower truck. And here you see the blower truck five stories down. Um, it was basically pushed that material through the hose and brought it up to the roof. Really an amazing, um, uh, an amazing feat here. But five stories where we were was really the limit of what that truck was capable of pushing out. So the distrib distribution of the media took about two weeks. We had frequent breakdowns, the hose would rip, the truck would break down. So it was not the easiest process. Otherwise, uh, when that would, those breakdowns would happen, we could also bring the media up again by super sack and crane, um, but then we'd have to apply it uh, by hand and wheelbarrow. So it's not a, not a quick process. Now, I mentioned that uh, I'm calling this growing media and not soil media. There is no soil in this particular media. Here's a close-up of the growing media, and uh, we'll go through here in a second what it was made of. So in this particular project, there were three types of, of uh, growing media uh, recipes. One was an intensive mix. An intensive mix really has a much higher uh, moisture retention capability and a higher fertility uh, content. So you can see here, um, it contained uh, heat expanded shale, but it also contained 15% uh, sand and 25% compost. That compost component is really what makes uh, the moisture retention uh, uh, capability of that particular particular mix. The next mix, the extensive mix, is for lower fertility plants. And again, 
you can see the sand and compost uh, components of this were switched. Um, less compost in this particular mix. It needs sharper drainage. And then finally, we had a bog garden mix. Yes, we had a bog garden on top of a roof, mostly peat moss, sand, and then a little bit of long fiber sphagnum. So here's the construction area after the application of the growing media. You can see the framing, the timber tech, the forest, the uh, porous pavers, uh, all coming together to start making this feel like a real landscape. Here you can see the elements after the uh, growing media has been installed. And I, I really like this particular slide because it shows all layers of the uh, construction elements uh, of the green roof. You can see the waterproof membrane at, uh, applied on the concrete base in the lower right. Then you see that black um, drainage mat and root barrier. You can see that carpet patterning of the moisture retention mat. And then finally the, the um, design elements of the diamond rock and the growing media uh, being applied there as well. So you can kind of see that peeled back like the layers on an onion. And here we are after the, all of the growing media has been installed and it's really starting to look like a landscape here. The next step, we would install other infrastructure needs such as electrical and irrigation. And then finishing out the uh, patios and even installed at last minute, we added a bocce court on top of the roof. So lots of very swank, sexy elements in this particular design. So talking about the, um, the green roof design elements, very unique and dynamic design. This particular project included five distinct eco zones. There was what we call a garden carpet, which was made of extensive, the ex extensive soil mix. So thinnest soil layer, sharp drainage, lower fertility. There was a dry wildflower garden. This was also the same soil mix, but the second thinnest layer, this had again, low fertility and sharp drainage, but was a little bit deeper so it could support some of the native plants and grasses. Next, we did have a small lawn, a scrub meadow, which is more intensive mix, six inch depth that was the thickest soil layer and was able to support our woody species and shrub layer. And finally, we again had that bog garden I mentioned earlier. So let's talk about the garden carpet first. Lots of great succulent plants, and I'm going to breeze through the plant part. You'll have to indulge my plant nerdness here as I have a lot of slides with pretty plants, but a lot of great sedums and succulents. Here's some sedums here, hens and chicks. Some of you are, are familiar with a lot of these plants in your own home gardens, but there's lots of different forms of sedums and succulents that give different colors, different root, uh, sorry, leaf shapes. Um, this is fame flower here, chives and alliums ice plants, if you're not familiar with some of these. These are very typical rock garden plants. Dianthus and pinks, um, blue fescues, uh, short grasses. Here's sea thrift, armeria. Um, not a particularly popular plant, but one that I particularly love. So if you have rock garden plants, rock garden at home, these are perfect for that application. But here's that illustration, that garden carpet, stitching together colors and textures to create a very dynamic and interesting design effect. Can see here as it so this is about a year after planting another close-up view here of those succulents and uh, the uh, small grasses next is the uh, dry wildflower garden a uh, long plant list here but again focusing more on the native plants which typically in our environment are much more hardy and um, uh, tolerant of those wide temperature swings those um, uh, alternating seasons of great saturation, as well as great drought. So Speedwell here, lots of plants in the daisy family. This is New England Aster, Black-Eyed Susans, Purple Coneflower, lots of great interesting um, cultivars, different colors of those coneflowers, whites and pinks, double forms. Here's blue leadwort. Um, Spurges also made up a great component of this wildflower meadow. Grasses, this is Korean feather grass or Calamagrostis. Again, more um, plants in the daisy family. Here's some tick seed, um, some daisies, some more threadleaf tick seeds. Also moving on to bee balms. These are plants that would, you would find in the native meadows at uh, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, also in the meadow that, um, uh, that Shannon referenced early, created by the Heritage Conservancy. Again, great opportunity for grasses, native grasses and non-native grasses in this instance. Cat mints, uh, daisy family, uh, mint family and grasses, um, you will see are very, very successful in meadow um, plantings. 
um, sages, again, more grasses. And here you go with the, um, the, uh, the one year after the uh, pictures that illustrate the gardens as a whole as they've stitched together. You can see, again, wide variety of blooms, colors, textures here with the diamond rocks, the grasses, the blooming asters. Uh, this particular photo was taken late fall uh, the following year after planting. Next, talk a little bit about the lawn. This was the intensive uh, growing media, uh, higher fertility, higher moisture retention. We used Bella bluegrass, which is a cultivar of bluegrass that has very low or no mowing requirements. Uh, reduced uh, mowing needs for about 50 to 80 percent. That grass particularly maxes out at about three and a half to four inches. Very high heat tolerance, very low fertility requirements, high wearability, and a lower irrigation requirements, 20 to 30 percent less water needs than other bluegrass cultivars, and is a very fast lateral grower. It does not uh, spread by seed, but rather it spreads by under, underground rhizomes. We used about 6,200 plugs in this uh, particular project. Next is the scrub meadow, which basically includes um, our uh, native uh, wildflowers as well as shrubs and woody species. Here we have uh, shrubby syncophoils, both yellow and pink cultivars. We have catoni asters, uh, creeping raspberries, St. John's wort, just like the herb you can buy at the pharmacy. Um, Itea or Virginia Sweet Spy are a wonderful uh, uh, mid-Atlantic uh, native, uh, great fall colors you can see here, um, shrubby honeysuckles, and one of my favorite plants, false spirea or sarbaria, uh, Japanese rose or rugosa rose, um, oh, Clethra alnifolia uh, or, or summer sweet. This is again one of my favorite uh, native shrubs here in this particular region, and uh, Sambucus or elderberry. Um, and so here again are some of those examples of a year after with that scrub meadow planting showing that variety of color and texture really uh, with the basis um, beside that uh, native wildflower area as well. Here you go. Imagine coming to this you know, on a coffee break in your busy work day, enjoying this, you know, really making this a dynamic and uh, invigorating um, experience. Next is the bog garden, which I think was really one of the more unique um, opportunities here on the roof. Here we are with early construction stage. This is September slash October 2009. We started laying out an EPDM rubber liner to hold the water of the pond. We used those uh, pool noodles, you know, those little noodles you take to the pool with you, you wrap around and they help you float. Uh, we used those rolled up in the EPDM liner to serve as the edging. And here we are, bridge construction that would go over the water. Again, it's the same timber tech on the flooring there. And here is the finished product immediately after planting. You can see the pond there and lots of rushes and cattails starting to grow uh, on after, uh, after, immediately after planting. Here's a little close up of that pond area. So some of the plants that we used, um, native sedges, there's a fox sedge, northern sea oats, um, and also several different types of rushes, um, mini cattails as well. One of my favorite flowering meadow and bog plants, cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis, um, as well as um, a variety of pitcher plants, which are also native to this area. Um, tall and short, um, lots of different cultivars and colors of pitcher plants here, but they love these bog garden um, uh, environments. Um, here's a very unique plant, bog garden plant we use. This is plantain. You will probably recognize this as a weed in your lawn, but we use this in our, in this particular cultivar, Rubifolia, uh, in our particular bog garden. They are a great bog garden plant. Uh, we used uh, copper iris, uh, an obedient plant. This is another great meadow and bog garden native uh, plant to the mid-Atlantic. Uh, Mazes, a great uh, uh, ground cover for shady wet areas. And in the pond, of course, we did use water lilies. And so here is the um, pond area, the bog garden, about a year after planting. Um, of course, our, uh, the designer had a great sense of humor. You notice the uh, alligator head in the pond here. But again, this is just a very engaging environment to provide for a workforce and for you know, the top of a corporate building. I mean, you wouldn't expect to see this in, in every commercial uh, structure. So very great design. So moving on to the next project, um, I want to talk a little bit about the development of High Glen Gardens, which is a 64-acre private estate in Frederick, Maryland, sitting at the base of the Catoctin Mountains, a part of the Blue Ridge Mountain Range, just down from Camp David. 
that was in the process of transforming into a public garden. Uh, the High, uh, High Glen Gardens was originally an agricultural use prior to the owner's purchase of the land. And this image shows the original barn and the construction of the new house around 2004 and 2005. Uh, here's an aerial view of the house and the barn with the finished formal gardens that were installed around 2008 after the house was built. So again, here's the history of High Glen Gardens. Again, reclaimed farmland. The owners are Frederick, Maryland natives and were very involved in the property development. The family business was in real estate development. So this particular property was purchased as a business opportunity with the intent to build around 75 single family homes on it. But eventually the owners decided, well, I think we're gonna keep this for ourselves. And in 2004 began construction of the home and the renovation of the original barn to the property. And here's the house in winter of 2005 completed and moved in um, this structure, uh, the house, the architecture was inspired by their trips abroad to Europe and it was really meant to look like it was dropped out of the Cotswolds of England and having a, you know, looking like it was a hundred plus years old, but it really was new construction at this time. Uh, here's the house in 2007, a couple years after it was built. Notice the, basically the blank slate of this property that's surrounding old farmland. Um, you can see basic foundation plantings to the rear and the side of the house in 2007, but when 2008 hit, we installed the uh, formal gardens behind that, and here you can see those formal gardens installed um, afterwards, almost the same kind of view shed as before. So in 2013 through 2014, we embarked to create the High Glen Master Plan. We worked with Robinson Anderson Summers, which is a firm here in Wilmington, Delaware, nearby, spent nearly a full year to develop the plan through workshops with the owners, with the staff, and group visits to other gardens, as well as a peer review process. What the master plan process really does, it is a complex uh, process, but it does have very specific order that helps stakeholders through the maze of determining the design and the function of their property long term. Knowing that this property was going to go from residential to um, public, we really wanted to go through that process very contemplatively because the, really the best gardens, the best spaces are reflections of the owners. We wanted to make sure we um, understood what their priorities were, what their design aesthetic was, so that as we went through the development, we really were reflecting the unique um, uh, uh, aesthetic of the owners, as well as the uniqueness of the property itself. So it begins, the process really begins with an understanding of what you have. In this instance, you can see this is the um, outline of the property. We really didn't have very much on it. Look how blank and empty that, that design is. You can see the house in the middle with the barn there to the side, um, but otherwise it's pretty much an, an, a, a blank canvas. We looked at that property through um, looking at analyzing site elevations. We looked at pedestrian and vehicular circulation, um, challenges that we knew we would have meeting um, ADA compliance or Americans with Disability Act. Um, so making sure that we had um, uh, uh, access, proper access for people with disabilities, as well as uh, uh, soil percolation and the study of existing plant communities. We studied site hydrology, the way water moves, not only above ground, but underground as well, as well as getting an understanding of the underlying um, utilities and infrastructure on the site. We studied the impressions of the garden, both from the inside and the outside, looking at view sheds from the outside looking into the property, as well as the view sheds inside the property looking out. What are the most optimal, aesthetically pleasing views that we needed to highlight as we went through the design process? So with vision and planning, the master site planning process can really take you from here, which is the blank slate, to really well vetted concept designs, envisioning what the property could really look like when it would be a fully functioning public space. So we came up in this instance with three different concept designs, uh, very similar in between, um, maybe ranging from more formal to less formal, um, bringing in more naturalistic elements uh, versus more axial landscapes. But we wound up after peer review and working through those concept designs with a finalized uh, approved plan here, as you can see, finalized with all the bells and whistles tied up neatly in a bow. 
once we got to that uh, point, we had the final design, then it was a matter of kind of laying it out in terms of phasing and um, understanding the schedule of, of uh, construction. So we had to, had to under plan the execution so that we could um, plan out the cash flow, the needed uh, financial resources to make this happen over the next 20 years in this case. Now, the elements of this master plan that are uh, particularly um, relevant to today's lecture um, are the wet meadow or wetland area and the woodland area. So I'm going to talk about these two uh, elements of the master plan in succession here. So here is the southeast corner of the property, what we call the wet meadow, which is really the, um, the wetland area here and a surrounding uh, uh, native wildflower meadow. So here is a picture dating back to around 2011. This is immediately before I joined the team at High Glen Gardens. You can see that southeastern corner of the property surrounded by turf and you can see that pool of water there in the distance. That really happens, you know, after a storm, rainwater would accumulate here and then eventually evaporate. But it's, you know, basically surrounded by um, open lawn. Here's a close up view from the road. Again, this was immediately after a storm. You can see that uh, that water had accumulated, storm water had accumulated there surrounded by turf. Um, this is the state that it was in when the property was purchased. The farmer previously, when this was in agricultural use, couldn't really get access uh, regularly to this part of the property because it was so wet. So it couldn't be plowed and it couldn't be mowed, but really it wasn't deep enough for water to really serve as a pond. So it was so ephemeral, it would come and go. So really only the hardiest of weeds would live here. No turf would obviously live. So it was either weeds or just open clay soil, which was no good. So we knew immediately we wanted to bring it back to its uh, natural state. Um, so what was really interesting about this particular project is if you look at this in advance of the real restoration work, um, you can see that shallow water would basically heat up in the sun after the storm and it would turn that whole area into like a very warm Campbell soup. So even if there was anything trying to survive in it plant-wise, it was very quickly cooked. So we in the uh, restoration project had to do two things. We had to make sure the water was kept cool. So we used a series of sprinkler systems to keep that water temperature cool uh, when the sun would come out immediately after storms. In addition, we were planting much larger plant material. Um, we started out with plugs that wasn't very successful. So we had to graduate to much uh, larger material which could withstand the uh, warmer temperatures uh, of this uh, during construction. And here we are post restoration. The surrounding turf to that area was converted also to a native wet meadow. All native material, sedges, reeds, uh, pickle reed, hibiscus, and also surrounded by great native uh, trees, which love these bog situation, bald cypress, was uh, really served as the basis for our tree canopy in this area here. And in 2016, we followed up uh, with um, a gorgeous Japanese-inspired cedar plank bridge over the water, which in the future will allow visitors a much more immersive experience uh, to the wetland. And so it really provides a future educational opportunity on why wetlands are so important to our um, ecosystem, why they're important to our waterways and channels, and, uh, and how they really function uh, environmentally. So, um, so I'm looking forward to that, uh, that coming to pass in the future. Here is again the how that uh, native wetland really um, ties into the rest of the property here. You can see surrounded by the fence and really a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. So next, I'll move over to the other side of the property, which is the northeast corner of the property and the future woodland garden. This is the second aspect of the master plan that included some restoration work to create a really beautifully ecologically responsible and um, uh, immersive um, restorative environment. So the design process, <laughs> here it is again, illustrating how complex it is. It, does, it forces us to think long-term how to add topography, infrastructure, utilities, 
all of those have to be thought about before actually um, any construction begins. Um, and it gave us also the opportunity to rough in a water feature in this particular design. Here we are with that water feature. You can see, let me get my this pointer here. It has uh, two pools. There's an upper pool, a channel moving the water down to a lower pond here. Gives an opportunity for a bridge, you know, walking path. So again, we're all thinking of the um, visitor experience when they would in the future when they will engage with this particular space. Now, we needed to know when we hit construction in this particular woodland garden, we needed to know what we had in terms of the soil. Therefore, we did significant testing and research with soil expert Dr. Frank Gwynn from the University of Maryland who has since passed. But he worked with us to complete uh, soil studies and help us understand what do we have now and what do we need to do in terms of soil amendments to support the tree species that we were going to be bringing in. We of course discovered being former agricultural land that the soils were critically low in fertility and organic matter and therefore had no insect life. And it also included a plow pan layer, which is about 12 inches down. For those of you who don't know what a plow pan layer, it's basically the, the layer of soil under ground that the, um, that the plow continually goes to but can't go past. After years and years of tilling and plowing, that plow pan layer gets very, very hard and water cannot infiltrate, root zones of plants cannot infiltrate. And so if you're going to build something like a wetland, you need to break up that plow pan layer. So first we did that with this giant piece of equipment, which was, has these giant teeth with dig into the ground and then is pulled across to break up that plow pan layer. Next, we imported hundreds and hundreds of yards of compost, including other additives like pine fines and sulfur, all determined by the soil tests that we did and the tree species that we wanted to plant. And here we are, final grade, and the trees starting to arrive in March of 2015. This is Quercus macrocarpa or burr oaks uh, from a nursery outside of Richmond, Virginia. And of course, did a lot of work citing tree locations per the design before we got into planting. We also did excavating for that small pond and water feature I was talking about earlier. Um, here you can see um, the lower pond being excavated now, recirculating pump and uh, uh, piping being installed. Here's an aerial view during construction. You can see the uh, upper pond here, the channel, and then the, um, the lower pond here in this area. You can also see that we're already playing with topography, creating some mounds and whatnot for some interesting plant communities. But also looking at the property in a whole, not just the woodland, but we really need to have overarching organization to this piece to really bring out the story of the woodland, looking mostly at plant communities, both native and non-native here. We were looking at, for instance, oak and tulip poplar communities, native rhododendron communities, non-native woods, uh, tupelo, sassafras, and service barrier communities. These are um, plant species that have the same environmental requirements that thrive together as a community. Um, you can, uh, for instance, uh, plant communities are one thing we talk about quite a lot at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. You're really looking at how not only native plants function by themselves, but how they relate to not uh, other plants in their environments, to pollinators, to wildlife species that use those plants in their um, plant communities as home, as food sources and whatnot. So we really were looking at it from a plant community perspective. And then you start building the design one phase of planting at a time, adding more plants each phase. This is one year of construction, the next year of construction, the next year of construction, until you really start putting the plants in the ground and seeing it come to fruition. So here we are about uh, two years after planting, you see all these young trees in the ground. And then a few years later, as they're starting to establish, um, here you can see this was, um, uh, planted in kind of a grassland. In this particular uh, project, we needed to do still a lot of soil reclamation. So we used this uh, fescue grass as a cover crop to keep working those roots into the soil, providing nutrients that seasonal grow and decay, adding nutrients into the ground, breaking up this plow pan layer even further. So you're seeing these trees planted within the, this uh, grassland um, component. So here you are, wide angle view, and then a view of the um, 
of the water feature, that double pond I was referencing earlier. So just imagine being that, that future tourist and visitor to this future public garden to be able to engage with this space. Of course, it will take years for this to develop to the same level of maturity as the moss garden in the first slide at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, but I feel very honored to have created the framework for what hopefully future generations will enjoy and experience their own version of Shinren Yoku or forest bathing. So that concludes my lecture here today. Thank you very much. I'll put this slide up at the bottom as my email address. Please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions that we don't get to here this evening. And i um, always happy to uh, visit with you when you come visit us at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. So please do come by and see us. Thank you, Peter. And uh, we do have a Q&A down at the bottom. So if you have any questions, please do put them there. We have a couple already. So if someone wanted to, and this is from Claire, if somebody wanted to start a rooftop garden, what resources would you recommend they consult? Other than a flat roof, what would they need to get started? Well, you could do a lot of research online, honestly. Like I said at the beginning, I am not a green roof professional, and the project that I was illustrating was is 11 years old, so that was installed in 2009. Um, but there's a lot of good information out there now online. There's some great books that you can read. Um, I'll point you to um, uh, Ed Snodgrass. Ed Snodgrass runs Emory Knoll Farms outside of Baltimore, Maryland, which is a nursery that really provides a lot of the plant material for green roof applications. He wrote a great book on called Green Roof Plants. So I might start there, um, checking out that book to kind of get a sense of what plant material is, um, survives uh, most uh, successfully in that application. Um, but there are probably some more advanced um, construction methods out there now that I'm not particularly familiar with, but I might start as I'm the plant nerd here, um, that uh, you start with the plants. So um, look up Green Roof Plants by Ed Snodgrass. Sounds good. Uh, another one from Claire, and I don't think that this is intended for you. I think this might have been directed at me. So when is Del Val going to start a rooftop garden? Well, Claire, actually, Del Val did do a rooftop garden in Haiti. So, <laughs> wow. So uh, you'll, you'll have to get a ticket and go visit it sometime. Uh, but you might talk to Michael Fleischacker. Uh, that was a project that he did several years ago. Now, when we're going to do it on campus, I don't know. Uh, we had a, a question that came in from the chat as well. How do you determine how much is allowed on the roofs? That's really determined um, in advance by the structural engineers who basically design the building. So they, in any building, you, you always need to know your weight restrictions on the roof, whether you're putting a green roof on it or not, because of course you need to deal with snow load, and the infrastructure, HVAC units, other components that need to sit on top of a roof. So part of a building construction will be a study and an analysis by a structural engineer as to what are the weight uh, capabilities of that roof. Um, we went into this particular project um, understanding from the start that the building was going to be constructed to support a green roof. Um, unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition like we were expecting. Um, so you need to be flexible enough to um, accommodate those changes when they do arise. But that is always part of a study of a roof anyway, um, particularly in our area where we do get snow load. Um, we have to be mindful of that from, from the construction of any building from the start. I'm going to stick to the theme of uh, the rooftop for now, but there is another question concerning internships, which I'll get back to. Uh, could you give an idea of the costs involved with the Arizona tea roof? <laughs> I wish I could. Thankfully, that was between the owner and the designer. <laughs> that was not something I needed to worry about, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but I will say that they are expensive applications. Um, when I got out of school in... Um, uh, 2010 is when I graduated from horticulture school. I really thought the future was going to be all rooftop gardens. I, my intent at the time was to just make sure all of the United States, every commercial building had a green roof on top of it. Um, but with the, with the um, great recession of 2000, 2008, 
2007, 2008, um, really uh, that didn't come to fruition like we'd hoped. Um, they are very expensive at the onset. Now, eventually you will recoup those costs, but it does take time. As I mentioned, you will be saving costs in terms of building insulation, um, heating and cooling costs. You will have a very, a very happy workforce, especially if you're inviting them to engage with that space, with this bog garden, with the putting green, with these patios, things like that in particular. Um, so there are some um, financial and non-financial benefits to the green roof, but they are expensive um, in terms of the upfront costs. Marion asks, uh, was the purpose of the bog garden on the roof to channel water from the rest of the roof before being drained, drained off? Uh, not particularly. We had to make sure that that, um, that was a very self-contained pond, that EPDM rubber liner that we were using really was not meant to be punctured. So there was, it, it would hold rainwater, um, but it really didn't interact with the rest of the garden. It was own, it was its own self-contained space, um, but it did serve uh, its own purpose in terms of kind of holding on to that rainwater, which is one of the purposes of the green roof a as a whole. So as I was mentioning, you know, that moisture retention mat, that drainage mat, these were all opportunities to keep water on site and release it more slowly over time. So you're not overwhelming, you know, municipal sewer systems with this sudden onslaught of water. Now that was a very different, you know, uh, philosophical change from like uh, earlier in the 1900s when the, 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 um, the construction philosophy was get rid of rainwater as fast as you can, move it out of the property, move it out of the property. Now it's, that's not the case. It's retain, retain, clean, bring it back slowly into the environment. But in that particular instance, the bog garden was self-contained. Before we lose this, I want to get back to the uh, the comment or question from Anonymous. Do you have any internship opportunities? If so, what do they focus on and how do you apply? We do. Um, you can send an email to me. My uh, email is there still on the screen. I'll be happy to guide you to the right uh, personnel. But in the past, we've had an education intern that works with us in the summer months to um, support our education programming. And then we also have a nursery intern that supports our native plant nursery efforts in terms of propagation and plant sales. So um, both are in the summer generally. Um, so I'd be happy to, um, to refer you on to the right people to discuss that. So please shoot me an email. I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Megan asks, uh, how can green uh, roof gardens help native wildlife and other animals in the area? Well, as I mentioned, um, native plants provide not only just pollen and nectar for pollinators, but their food source for birds, seeds, um, uh, they provide um, habitat. So there's a wide variety of benefits that these, this type of plant material can have for um, all types of wildlife. So, you know, when you get up there, uh, there's, you, you know, even uh, up to two years after the installation, I was finding amphibians. There were frogs in the bog garden that probably came up tadpoles with the plant material. There was a great uh, number of bird species, insect life up there. So you're starting to see this kind of interaction. Now it doesn't function exactly the same way as it would in the natural landscape at ground level planted in the native soils, but it does have, have a, a lot of uh, benefits to, uh, to wildlife and pollinators, certainly. Anne asks, with the intensive planting of the Arizona Tea Garden, how are the garden beds maintained? Deadheading, pruning back, et cetera. Yeah, it, it does take a lot of maintenance. So you, you do need to be up there um, being, you know, uh, particularly weeding. That's probably the number one. And this is similar to meadow establishment. And we saw this at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve in the establishment of our own meadow. And I'm sure the Heritage Conservancy did in the establishment of their meadow that Shannon was referring to is, meadows and plantings like this are not easy. You need to be very mindful and have the resources to address invasive plant material and weeds. So it's really removing, uh, being very vigilant to remove those before they go to seed and take over the entire garden, right? So that has to happen during the establishment phase very, very aggressively. Um, this garden, like any, almost like a native meadow, the first five years of meadow establishment are high input years. You have to have the resources to, to really get in there and uh, 
and address the, the invasives. So we had a very um, rigorous uh, maintenance regime in that particular green reef for the first couple of years, certainly. Claire asks, uh, is the business of creating new green spaces such as roofs and landscapes picking up? Do you see this trend continuing and expanding? You know, I would love to see it continuing and expanding. Um, green roofs, um, I hope eventually there will be an opportunity for that trend to catch on much more. Um, it is um, unfortunately challenging because those upfront costs are so high. So um, it, it's really difficult to do that. But if you look historically at Europe, um, company, uh, countries like Germany has a great green roof tradition and a lot of their urban centers utilize green roofs for all of those benefits. So I hope eventually here in America, we can follow the lead of um, our European friends um, and and bring that more into the to the front line of uh, of urban construction certainly. And Marion uh, asks, do you have a plant list for the green roof? I do, and if you shoot me an email, I'd be happy to uh, to send it to you. Cool. Well, I think that's uh, all of the questions that we had up here. Uh, I just would like to point out that from from my point of view as a wildlife person. Uh, and also being somebody who's kind of uh, pushing this One Health concept here at Del Val, that this is an excellent example of One Health, uh, demonstrating how uh, taking degraded habitats or habitats that are pretty much uh, non-existent habitats like a rooftop uh, and creating something from nothing uh, requires uh, really a lot of disciplines and uh, a lot of effort to make that happen, but then has a lot of benefits, which, uh, you know, some are easily seen and some not so much. Obviously, they're beautiful. Uh, certainly, that roof on the top of Arizona T has got to be uh, a real benefit to the employees there. And that uh, I wish I had it today so that I could have gone and sat in there for a few minutes. I'm sure my blood pressure would have been much better than it is. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that we can see over time the, that how wildlife uh, utilizes this. And if each and every one of us actually spent a little time looking at our own yards and, and saying, you know, how, how can I make this a little bit better? Uh, not only for myself, but for uh, everything else as well. Absolutely, and I will encourage people, listeners today, to um, you know stop by the the preserve uh, next year when our native plant nursery is open, because all it takes is one plant at a time. Come home to your home landscapes, install native plants, and start seeing the hummingbirds come in, the pollinators come in, the migratory bird species. This is a wonderful way we can engage within our environments in our own home landscapes as well. So I would encourage you to stop by and take a visit next year. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming by myself. Uh, it's been a while since I've been there and uh, it's been too long. Well, the trails are beautiful all times of year. So please stop by anytime. I will do that. And I hope everyone else does as well. Thank you everybody for attending uh, the seminar this evening. And thank you Heritage Conservancy for co-sponsoring the event. Uh, we hope to see you at our final One Health seminar uh, for this semester. and. Uh, if you're interested in joining us in the future, uh, drop me a line. It's just reghoyt at delval.edu, uh, and I'd be happy to put you on our list. Thank you, everybody, and have a great night.